So I'd like to start this morning with a question. And the question is, do you give a man a fish or do you teach them to fish? Now we can't really take a poll in here, but generally the collective wisdom is, of course, you teach a man a fish. Because if you give him a fish, you only feed a man for a day. But if you teach them to fish, you teach them for a lifetime. So if we all know that answer, and that we know the right answer is to teach people to fish, why is it, as a nation, we're not doing that? Well, so let's reflect. Um, in the 1930s, we, we hit a really hard time. It was called the Great Depression. And it was the first time in U.S. history that we really started looking at what were, uh, uh, we, we looked at, at thousands, tens of thousands of people that were hungry, uh, that didn't have jobs, that were hopeless, that didn't have the right skills, were, uh, were in, in bad shape. So we decided to start giving men fish. So we started feeding them. Well, why did we do that? Because we're a loving, we're a great, we're a compassionate nation, and uh, it just seemed like the right thing to do. And that was great. So now we're feeding these people. And so one day they get a fish, and the next day they come and they get a fish, and then the third day they get a fish, and after about two weeks full of fish, they're going, wow, you know, I'm uh, really kind of tired of fish. Do, do you have any meat? You know, I, the little potatoes would be nice, green beans, key lime pie. I love key lime pie. Do you have any? And, and oh, by the way, I'm, I'm living under a bridge. So do you have any place I could stay? You know, and, and so could, could you find a spot for me to live? And, uh, you know, I haven't been feeling very well lately. So could you? Well, you can see, you know, out of the best of intentions, one thing leads into another. So then we start taking this compassionate act and we turn it into uh, kind of some laws and regulations about how we're going to distribute fish to people. And, and so then we come up with rules. And so people start following these rules. And by following these rules, they try to beat the rules. And this is a very slippery slope. What we end up with is this notion of unintended consequences. You see, what happens when you give people fish, um, they become reliant on you and they're no longer hungry. And so their incentive to go out and find their own fish goes down substantially. Now our intention is to prop you up and then teach you, and then you are going to feed yourself, you're going to feed your children, you're going to teach your family, and everything is this upward spiral. But sadly, what ends up happening is that we create this downward spiral, that where uh, people become dependent on getting fed fish, and so then they teach their children the notion about how you should be fed fish, we have a, a bunch of people eating and nothing to do because we don't expect anything from them. Well, you, you know, when you've got nothing to do, you're going to go out and find stuff to do. And so sadly, uh, especially in the poor neighborhoods, which is largely what we're talking about here, is um, they, they don't generally find constructive things to do. And, and so teen pregnancy goes up like crazy, and crime goes up, and we form gangs, and we sell drugs, and you know, there, there's a whole bunch of kind of downward spiral that comes out of all of that. Now the poor don't want to be poor any more than we want them to be poor, but uh, they, uh, they have been taught and they have learned and by the time you get to a third generation poor family, they don't even know anybody that knows anybody that's been successful or how to break out. So this is a bad situation, not very exciting, and uh, it's this notion of entitlement. Uh, it's created lots of problems. Uh, we have gone from 72% of our population being married down to 52%. 40% of our population or, or of our newborn children are born out of wedlock. 
I mean, I can go down through all of these statistics that sadly have kind of flowed out of this issue. So what do we do now? It's taken us 60, 80 years to screw it up this bad. What are we going to do to begin turning that around? And, and that kind of now brings in my story and, and the journey that we're on and hopefully we'll be on together. So uh, I'm a business guy. Uh, more specifically, I'm an entrepreneur. I've started and grown a number of reasonably successful technology companies. The last one I sold in 1997 to Sprint. Um, thankfully, and you know, isn't capitalism a wonderful thing? Um, it put me and a whole host of our employees in a position to be able to do most anything we want. Start new companies, uh, become on, you know, uh, philanthropists, to lay on the beach, really anything. So I started thinking a lot about what should I do next. And I read this book uh, titled From Success to Significance. Uh, and, and the essence of the book was, okay, now what, hotshot? You got this done. Well, what are you going to do for mankind? And what, what is your great thing going to be in life? So I looked at that really hard. And uh, what I decided I'm most passionate about are at-risk kids. Kids that come from the environment we've been talking about, but are as bright and as capable as any in all the world. But for a whole host of reasons, they can't even see the opportunities that are in front of them. So I started a foundation called the Holt House Foundation for Kids, and I went on this learning journey around the country. So I, I went uh, from coast to coast looking at the best programs, the programs that have earned the reputation of having significant impact on these kinds of kids. And I was looking for best practices. What is it that they're doing? What is it that they're teaching? And I learned a whole bunch of things, as you might expect. But the most surprising piece that I learned was, I guess, something that everybody in this room already knows. Um, when you say, well, what's the way out? The answer is education. Education's the way out. But when Americans think about education in our society today, we think about school. We think about reading, writing, math, science. We think about government-run public education that is teaching us today, largely, how do we fill out standardized tests and regurgitate information um, in order to pass from one grade to the next. Well, as I started doing the research and the studies, what I found was that there is very little correlation between academic success and life success. Now, of course, the trick is how do you define life success? There's some correlations financially, but successful, happy, healthy lives. Um, and, and so I started looking at what is the other half of, of uh, education. And what that is, there's many names for it, but it's really social and emotional learning. It's life skills, it's character, it is having a vision for your future, it is having a moral compass that guides you, it's about hard work and determination, it's learning to pick your friends and who are not going to be your friends, how to get along with others, how to work in teams, how to lead teams, it is all the stuff our families are supposed to teach us. Well. The schools aren't teaching that. In fact, by charter, they're not supposed to teach that. They're busy teaching education. And if the family has fallen apart, by and large, who's going to teach it? Who is it that can hold the families accountable? Well, and, and look at what does a family mean today? I, I mean, a family is 58% is of all marriages... 58% uh, of all marriages end up in divorce. All these homes, mom and dad, are working, if there are even mom and dad. And in most of the families, dad is long gone. 
And so they've got all of these issues to deal with. And so what's not happening is that we're not teaching kids the most important part of education, and that is the life skills, character, and interestingly enough, entrepreneurship. Because if, if you go out to Google and you type in characteristics of an entrepreneur, what you'll find is these life skills and character, interestingly enough, is what they're best at. You know, in all these great universities, it is not the A students who built those buildings, it's all the C students <laughs> that were really good at communicating and getting along with people. So we start this organization called Prepared for Life. Um, I think the name is indicative of what it is that we're trying to accomplish, and that's to prepare kids to become healthy, happy, contributing members of our world. And so we're kind of doing some after-school programs and all this stuff, and my daughter, Lissa, one Saturday comes up to me and says, Daddy, can we get a turtle? A turtle? Lissa, we've got two dogs, two cats, you've got rabbits, we've got fish. Are you crazy? What are we going to do with a turtle? No. Well, uh, being a persistent 10-year-old little girl, all I heard about all day long was this silly turtle. Until finally I'd had enough. Lissa, no, we're not getting a turtle. So the next morning, come bright and early, 6 a.m., she comes bounding into the bedroom, jumps on top of me with this great idea, let's do a lemonade stand. Well, at 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, I hadn't put together that there was a correlation between the turtle and the lemonade stand. <laughs> Um, and, and so, to make a long story short, it was an unbelievable day. Because she knew the proceeds were going to this turtle. She was, she was asking all these questions, really interested in being successful. We were talking about revenue and profits and expenses and <laughs> capital equipment and, you know, where's the best place for a stand? And, and at the end of that, I go, wow, here I am a reasonably successful entrepreneur, and I never took the time to teach Lissa how capitalism, free enterprise, works in the greatest country in the world. And on that day, Lemonade Day was born. Now what Lemonade Day is this really cool program that teaches you how to start their own business using a lemonade stand. Now, how many of you in here have done a lemonade stand in your life? Okay, so we know that a lemonade stand is the quintessential icon for a child's first business. You know, whenever I say to somebody, well, we're teaching kids how to start their own business with a lemonade stand, the first two things happen. The first thing they do is smile, and the second thing they do is nod, because it immediately takes us back to a simpler time. When families were involved and we were investing in our kids and we were showing them what were the steps to be successful and we were involved in their education and I believe that we need to bring that back. America is all about entrepreneurship. It's all about um, us taking care of ourselves and our family and the American dream and being successful at anything it is that we want. So what do we do? We started this thing, Lemonade Day, in Houston five years ago. In the first year, we did 2,600 stands, then 11,000 stands, then 28,000 stands, then 38,000. Last year, 53,000 stands, you know, 150,000 kids. And, oh, by the way, it's not just in Houston. We're now in 31 cities across America. We're changing the way kids see the world. Now what we teach them is set a goal, you uh, do a budget and kind of a plan, and then you go out and get the seed capital that you need, then you do advertising, then you pick your spot, you come up with your product, you build a stand. We teach them all of that really great stuff. And they do that with a caring adult, and uh, all of them start their stands on a single day we call Lemonade Day. And on that day, it's, it's all about selling and 
making money, and at the end of the day, they have this fistful of cash, and we ask them to do three things. We ask them to spend some, to save some, and to share some. Spend some, you set a goal up front, go achieve that goal. That's how it works. Uh, save some, because in the lemonade business, some days it rains. <laughs> you might want to prepare for that. And finally, all successful businesses have this obligation to give something back. This year, the kids in Houston alone gave back to our community, to the, their church, to the Boy Scouts, to, their home, to the homeless shelter, over $2 million back to the community. And what do they learn? It really comes down to this, that, uh, that you can set a goal, you can make a plan from a, no matter where you are, you can work like crazy against that plan and achieve your dream. And that changes how they see the world forever. So in time, do you give a man a fish? Do you teach him to fish? Well, I would contend that giving a man a fish takes away all of their incentive. It's a very kind thing to do. But this notion of tough love, as a nation, as a people, it's time for us to love on our citizens and make them go do something. We're all better off by doing that. It's a compassionate thing, but we also have to turn around and teach them and give them the skills and give them the self-esteem that comes with setting a goal and accomplishing it. So I think Lemonade Day is going to start a movement across the country. We're going to, we have this goal to do a million stands in a single day in a hundred cities across America by 2013. And I think we're going to get there. And when we do, it is going to take us uh, the tipping point all across the nation. Because ultimately, I think the answer is this. We don't give a man a fish. We don't even teach him how to fish. Let's teach him. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.